It's the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast. A celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm Bob Perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we're learning from Fonzo. Now, Fonzo is a rapper, and something I learned after the cast is, I think he said that he's finished his degree in sound engineering now. So, yeah, sound engineer as well. And that would kind of make sense if you listen to his music, because he's also a producer, uh, mostly of his own stuff, but I think he does stuff for other people as well. And yeah, man, Fonzo is someone who I have followed for quite a while, like I'm probably about six years now. I've really enjoyed his music for a long time. I've enjoyed a lot of his releases. And I even tried to book him in Durban for a music festival once. And it was close. We nearly got it sorted out. But then uh, my boss said, nah, we, we can't spend money on that. Instead, we're going to book Prime Circle. So, you know, uh, creative differences or different like philosophical differences when it came to booking uh, there. So... Might, might give you some insight into why that only happened once. Anyway, yeah man, this was such a fun chat. It's uh, all about hip-hop, like, pretty much. It's just straight up about rap music in Cape Town, around the world, back in the day, currently. And yeah, just all the things when it comes to hip-hop music. So if you're into rap, you are going to really enjoy this podcast. And I... Like, if you don't know Fonzo, please go check out his music, because I think he's fucking good, man. Like, that's why he's on the podcast, and that's why I've followed him for so long. I just think he's a really fucking good rapper, and someone who I think has been slept on. Like, I know everyone says they're being slept on and everything like that, but yeah, I think Fonzo has been slept on a bit by the public. And so, yeah, go, go give him a listen, and you'll get to know him in just a little bit. Um, cool, so I'm gonna tell you some real shit now, <laughs> uh, I don't know, like, I've been having, if you follow me on Instagram, and if you got me on Facebook, you'd know that I've been having a bit of a tough time at the moment, because last week Thursday, um, I got a phone call from my mom telling me that my grand had been hit by a car, which is, uh, not a phone call you wanna hear, thankfully, it didn't have, you know, the worst part of that potential situation and so yeah my gran is okay um in that she hasn't broken any bones she didn't have to stay in hospital and is not mobile um definitely not mobile she's quite banged up she's quite bruised up and cut up and yeah just not in, not in good shape at all and a lot of pain and so, yeah, I went and I've been staying at my grand's place for the last week or so, well, since Thursday. So last week when I did the podcast, well, when I did the intro, it was actually straight after I got that call. And I obviously didn't want to bring it up then because I didn't really know the vibe and just, yeah, well, <laughs> didn't want to think the worst or anything like that. And... Yeah, so I did the podcast thing and then quickly caught uh, Uber out to Northeen where my grand stays. And I've been looking after her and my grandfather for the last week. And some of you may know my grandfather has skin cancer and it's pretty late stage. And it is quite... It is not, like, easy. Uh, to deal with and see and just cater to and yeah it's been a bit of a struggle it's been quite a lot to take on if I'm honest but it is also something I was preparing for for a while I just didn't expect it under these circumstances I mean I was offering to go help during lockdown and stuff like that and they said no they didn't need anything and well, now they both need the help, and it's been, yeah, it's been a lot, and I'm learning, <laughs> I'm learning a lot, like, put it that way, about myself, about them, about life, about death, about fucking disease, about 
just so much and in a small way there's there has been some cool things that have come from it uh my grand's been telling me some stories well at least last night we were sitting and we were chatting and it was quite cool um she told me that she actually used to go watch wrestling live because i was wearing my wrestlemania 2000 sweater and she was like what's that i was like ah, oh, it's a wrestlemania sweater she was like oh you like wrestling I was like yes grand i actually i actually do and she told me how she used to go watch it uh, live. And I thought that was so fucking cool. So I, we both agreed that WWE sucks and just, yeah, it's not a vibe. But then I showed her some AEW and I showed her some Orange Cassidy. And she loved it. She really, really enjoyed watching Orange Cassidy do his uh, wrestling with his hands in his pockets and... It's, yeah, it was a really cool little moment to get to bond with my gran over fucking a comedy wrestler. So that was cool. I also learned a bit about my history, well, the, the family's history. And small little tidbit, uh, but I am actually related to someone in Fleetwood Mac. They're like my fifth cousin. But yeah, uh, Christine Perfect or Christine McVeigh is a family member a very very distant family member i think my grand said it was her dad's cousin's daughter i think that was the vibe so yeah the perfect thing even though it's not my real surname it is my family tree it is my lineage and you know there's just some famous as fuck people that are involved you know and i'm gonna be the next person involved in that maybe maybe not not I'm not really trying too hard in the fame thing. I I must I must admit. Um yeah, and I also just learned a bit about my family history in terms of the fact that like everyone in my grand's family could apparently play music, like her father, her uncles, brothers, everyone uh, could play music except for one dude who I think his name was Lee and he would dress up in his mom's clothes and tell jokes. And, uh, I guess I know which member of the family I might take over, take after with regards to that. So, yeah, while it's been, fuck, just not a good time. Not, <laughs> not even a fucking little bit. Uh, it actually has been a little bit of a good time in some cases. So, yeah, swings and roundabouts and fucking gotta find the joy in even you know just the most terrible things so yeah that's that's where i'm at that's what's been going on and things might get a little weird for a little while because i'm i'm actually at home now just for the night my aunt is staying over there looking after them and then i'm gonna go back in the morning because i didn't have all my stuff uh for the, the podcasting and stuff and i also just wanted to get some other work done. I haven't been able to really get some work done. So good deadlines and all of those things. So yeah, I came home, been at it, and I also got to play some games with Mo. So that was a nice relief. But back in the saddle, back trying to get some work done, and then tomorrow I head back. And yeah, my grand's healing up a bit, but I don't know, it will probably be a couple more days whilst I'm there. And thankfully they've got a carer well, I think there should be a carer coming in tomorrow for my grandfather that finally pulled the trigger on that because my grand's been doing most of the work with regards to looking after my grandfather. And now that she can't really do that, they have decided, cool, let's actually, yeah, <laughs> let's take that next step. And we'll see where things go from here. It's... It is what it is, unfortunately, but yeah, it's, you hear about things, you see it in movies. I know I've had friends who have lost people very recently and, you know, you can try and empathize, empathize, empathize uh, with them, but it's something that I don't think until it's right in front of your face that you can really, you know, understand and it's still different regardless. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't really know where to go with that. Uh, not really going to do a Patreon pitch today because that would just 
be fucking weird and awkward. And yeah, sorry for bringing the mood down just a little bit. But I've got to be real with you. And that's that's where I'm at. So cool. That's awkward. And <laughs> yeah, sorry, no shout outs or anything. I don't, I just don't want to fucking chill for fucking money or do anything with regards to that shit right now so yeah i'm gonna just cut it here and i'm gonna say here comes the almost perfect podcast with fonzo so how are you living fonzo hey man i'm good how you doing bob i'm i'm all right i've had a i had a bit of a rough week but i'm pretty stoked to be back on the mic and you know doing some work getting getting in the game i guess you know it's like it's nice to have a little bit of normality I'm going to introduce why like my week was rough uh, in the introduction, but we certainly do not need to talk about it. Oh, how's goodness. your how's your week been going? Uh, my week's been chilled, man. Just been doing some painting in the room, just some, you know, maintenance and things with regards to the space here. And I've been cleaning things, rolling up cables and just doing also some checks on, on Ableton and some of the other sessions, just some stock taking for what we've done for the year and just how we're looking artistically. So that's a direct answer for my actual week. So that's what I've been up to, man. Oh, nice, man. And also I assume you've been uh, keeping up with the Cape Town uh, Twitter drama. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. That was that was quite a, quite a thing, man. I feel like that frustration was coming on a long time. It wasn't even like a new thing. Like everyone's been thinking a lot of that for a long time and they just use that as, you know, a springboard to get what they wanted across. I just be saying what I want when I want, man. If that's one thing about me, I've had this conversation like last year, November or September. I said all of that, but not DJ like centered or focused more about it happen and music in the city and my feelings about it. And what, okay, let's actually get into that. So how do you, how do you see the rap scene in CT? I feel like there's so many talented people here and so many just dope producers, but I don't feel like there's enough critical listening. I don't feel like there's enough unity. And I certainly don't feel like there is a unity amongst all the creatives, you know, in the city. It's kind of like if you're a dope videographer and you get an ad agency or something from Joe Berg that fucks with you like that with your work, you're gone. You know, all respect to you. Same with the singers, same with the photographers. But it's just like a, a lot of these people you meet like down the line and see their dope work and you're like, they're from Cape Town, but you'd never know, you know? And I just feel like that's detrimental to the whole scene. It's just like how much longer, are, you know, we're going to put up with not being honest about our progression and, and also just not trying to put the city on, man. What a beautiful city we live in. People come here and shoot all these ads and have these video shoots and photo shoots and parties year after year. It's the same damn thing. And we're not using it because everything's so segregated. It's segregated in terms of race or just in terms of like just being clicky? Just being clicky. I don't even think it's a race thing for, for me personally when it comes to the art. Art is one of those things where if you inherently like racist, you're going to get called out within two seconds, you know, and... It's it's funny. Or, or you're going to find a different scene. <laughs> like, I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll find your audience. <laughs> For sure. I mean, a perfect example of that is the guy I made a song with, you know, shout out to Costa, but people were defending Costa about, you know, his usage of vernacular language. And then Costa kind of said in the interview that he did, you know, Google Translate for some of his songs. And people were like, what, dude? Like, wait a minute. So... Yeah, man, you'll get called out in the yeah. art sphere. So my, my, my grip is not about the racial tensions or whatever. It's just more about the actual scene. And, and that's got to do with the actual individual creatives and everyone just being a little too clicky for us to progress as a city, not just your click or your people. And I've worked with many of people, man. I really have, like, politics aside, if people look at the actual track record and the things that I don't be putting out there, I've recorded, I've done artwork, I've helped write, like I've produced so many things that, you know, I thought was in the better kind of just, I don't know what the fuck the word I'm looking for is, but I just thought it was for the greater good, basically, you know, and then it turns out people were just trying to get there, you know, their little favor and uh, carry on. 
I think I think those problems arise everywhere though. You know, like I think it's part of the creative scene thing where artists don't necessarily like people don't people see it as a path, you know, mm-hmm. and there's only so much of the path to go around. There's mm-hmm. only slices are only so big. But I'm, you know, more a fan of that saying, uh, rising tide floats all boats, you know? Mm-hmm. It's Every, everyone comes up together. Like you, like for me, it's like I always just say, like, look at Odd Future. You know, look what they did. Yeah. And that was just a group of friends who put each other on and mm-hmm. were talented and helped each other get better. And now they fucking, you know, own the world in many different ways. Mm-hmm. And I've wanted that in Durban. And I tried to do that with some people. And yeah, egos get in the way. People have different objectives. People want different things you know yeah. and it's hard to get that unity when like you know it's teamwork makes the dream work but who's dream yeah so i think that's that's what gets in the way sometimes is just that whole people wanting to yeah you people are scared man that they're not going to make it if someone else does and i know that feeling very well in the comedy scene you know there's only so many slots on a fucking bill so yeah. it's yeah, it's the competitive nature, I think, of creativity that we're in, unfortunately, mm-hmm. that I think creates those attitudes. Nah, 100%, man. It's just, you know, difficult when you, you've you been spending years, you know, trying to get people in the mindset of, you know, we really can all eat here. Like, we have everything we need to make this one of the greatest hubs that there is. Like, I'm sorry, but Joburg, shout out Durban. I'm even from PE, so, like, all these major oh, cities, I see you guys, you know, it's love. It's always love, but nobody can deny that Cape Town is, you know, inherently one of the most racist cities, but it's also <laughs> the most beautiful. Like it really is something special. And if the arts can, you know, elevate itself to that level, there's nothing stopping it from becoming, you know, a, a New York city of some sort. And I know I sound a bit delusional by saying that, but I really don't think I am. If someone had told you, when you were young, like Toronto would be a city in, in hip hop, you know? Well, Atlanta, dude. You, you know what I mean? Everyone would be like, what? Like, that's not going to be a hub of any sort, you know? And Toronto for like four years straight there was like the go-to city for any Sonics in hip hop, you know, Drake and all the alternative R&B cats like The Weeknd and all of the other bubbling under artists from that city and the producers especially. Like, come on, out of nowhere? Like, I didn't even know what Toronto was until I got to high school and chose to do geography in grade 10. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I couldn't care less for Canada because that's what American media made us think. Like, oh, look, it's Canadians. Yeah, South Park did them dirty, bro. <laughs> now they really did. And then Biba and Drake changed the whole narrative, bro. Two people alone. You you cannot ignore Canada and especially not Toronto with Drake. I think Ryan Gosling's also Canadian. I mean, but come on, bro. Like, you know, the, the kind of just hip hop and city love and connection. <laughs> no, I, know. It's, it's I was just saying, different. like, Canada's got some talent. <laughs> now nah, they do. They do. Like, uh, even in, in football, man, this guy Davies is a left back. He plays for Bayern Munich. Stupendous talent. Like, he's going to be something special. And another one, his name is Davies and Davids, actually. Davids is a striker. He plays in France somewhere. Canadian chaps, and they are ballers. So, shout I'll out to Canada. A big, I take it you're a bigger football fan, and I kind of know that from your music because one of my favorite, favorite, uh, genuinely, like one of my favorite lines, not just from your song, but uh-huh. like just in general, is uh, where you say, put the FIFA in the uh, top cupboard, up your game, fam. What's it? Fuck, <laughs> yeah, I've put the FIFA the in the top cupboard, up your game, fam. <laughs> I fucking love that line. It's dude. so silly, bro, but shout out, man. Like, it's just one of those, you know, literal and figurative kind of just things, plays on language, and... I guess you can appreciate it because your craft is words too, man. It's just one of those things yeah. that coincide. Comedy and music are just, I don't know, man. We can we can argue about this, but I think they're so similar because both of us need punchline. Of course. And we need to be creative with the words. So, And timing is everything. Same with music, you know. You can say something profound, but if you do it in the wrong way, no one's going to care. Especially rap music. I definitely, I don't think any comedian would, you know, deny that the two have massive, massive similarities. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, the one thing I did want to chat to you about is like what's weird about the Cape Town thing is that Cape Town's actually got that history of hip hop. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at Brasser from the Cop mm-hmm. <laughs> as uh, one example. 
Um, and then just in general, the whole African dope records thing, tons and tons and tons of hip hop came from there. Yep. Did that influence you at all? Unfortunately not, man. I'll be straight up. I can get all the flack in the world for that answer, but I'm <laughs> from Bethel's daughter hey, in Port honest. Elizabeth. Yeah, like I'm from Bethel's daughter in Port Elizabeth. And we didn't have no, you know, no one feeding us. We didn't love what the culture was back here in Cape Town in that time. I only moved to Cape Town when I was like 14 years old. So what do I know about what Brasafani Cap and them were doing, you know, albeit important and albeit very powerful in, in terms of their political content and just the things that they were trying to do. But unfortunately, I was influenced by mainstream television and mainstream radio and what was popping. You know, I'm not going to adjust my story to fit a certain narrative or to get favors from certain people you know i can just be me and as beautiful as what they did in terms of laying the foundation for bringing hip-hop the side is i unfortunately was not fully immersed in that growing up and you know it might be a little unfortunate for me to have missed all of that but i still feel hip-hop is bigger than just you know one city or a certain group of people you know, it's still touched yeah, definitely. Me. So I think that should be the most important thing is that I still came around. You know, I was still bitten by hip hop and I've been smitten ever since. You know, I love the shit. So who were you guys? Who were your guys growing up? Hey, man, I I'm going to be super real with you. So the first people to really have caught my eye in terms of hip hop were probably the most obvious, which were your, your Nas and, and your your packs and your biggies you know okay. that, that's what the cool i was i was actually going expecting you to say like 50 cent or something just mm. like from your new album it's definitely got like for me i hear like it's like a mix between like current tde stuff like schoolboy yeah. q and that and then Papa like schoolboy yeah that g unit stuff as well yeah man it's I, we're talking about like early on right so i'm talking mm. about like when i was like seven which was probably the year 2000 those guys were being played still you know because remember only certain people had albums and there wasn't really mp3s or emails or anything of the sort or usbs to transfer the music so they only had what they had and the albums that were being able to purchase and when the album's like two three years old it drops like 20 30 rand in its price so that's what i heard and a lot of house music I cannot, I can't be on this podcast lying to you talking about it, but... Hey, bro, you're a South African. Like, hey, of man. course you grew up listening to house music. And I'm from the Eastern Cape, bro. House music was huge, and I still love it to this day. But when I could be, like, when I understood a better kind of portion of language and I could actually comprehend a lot of the lyrics, the first album that really gripped me was Nas's I Am album. And mm. he was he was saying some things on there that you know i didn't fully comprehend but it was more than just some of the party music and you know buck buck's message was always beautiful but there's only so much of buck's like passionate delivery i could take to this day you know people always like oh who's your favorite buck or biggie i'm like biggie bro like of course <laughs> but he released one album it was a fucking banger it and start to finish. <laughs> has too many like that's the thing like it's it's that's the problem with the debates is biggie could have carried on and maybe released some shit tracks but he never got the opportunity whereas puck put out tons of music and a quarter of it's like really really good yeah like outstanding and the rest, yeah and the rest is not and <laughs> like, people don't like that bro people don't hear that and i'm i'm more for you having your opinion bro but like i'm looking at the rap not just from a content perspective you know i think it would be silly to look at the rap from a content perspective only you know that's like in any medium or in any field there's always something you know that you can love and not love about something and whether it be yeah. like you know directors like ridley scott and the alien shit or you know david finch or anyone else there's certain things that you love about them but there are certain things you can criticize and you can love buck for his content and for his passion but we are not going to sit here and act like he was a cleaner rapper flow wise than biggie ever was bro biggie was <laughs> everything he was the blueprint for swag without needing a word to describe yeah. it that's what he was there was just a certain thing about him that no one has been able to replicate not even in the slightest and i'm sorry i've had many a conscious rapper that rap me a conceptual verse or a verse where I was like, wow, like, you know, you are saying something beautiful and the music kind of sounded a little better. So, you know, no, no disrespect to Pac. 
I'm just stating facts because if we're going to go, you know, pound for pound, it's Biggie all day, bro. Yeah, I 100% agree with you there. And I grew up in Ambilo where both those guys were played heavily. Mm -hmm. Like whatever car you got into, it was for a long time, yeah, either Biggie or Puck. Yeah. Then then people got into Dre uh, when, what was it, Dre 2000? Yeah, or, Chronic. Yeah. Even before that, Fuck Chronic when... was like 19, could be 97. And then 2001 was in 2000. I just remember, yeah, like I think... I think, yeah, the black guys were still on, like, were on board with Dre then, but mm -hmm. like it was 2000 that the white kids came on board. <laughs> yeah, because like, Eminem I think came Getting through. Eminem involved there, yep. and then also, yeah, obviously Snoop and everything like that. Yeah. That album did numbers in the South Durban area. Yeah. Yeah, so who else, who else were you guys? Um, moving on from my experience with Nas, you know, it kind of just also gave me this favoritism for more lyrical slash conscious hip hop. I don't like that word because, you know, conscious could mean a whole bunch of things. And I keep having this argument with mm -hmm. people. But at, there's no denying Ja Rule at that time. There's no denying Nelly Ooh, at that snap. time. There's no denying 50 at that time. There's no denying M at that time either. And Was Busta on your list? The Busta is high on my list now. Unfortunately, not back then. Busta was very really alternative. Same with Outcast. Like, they were very like, mm, what is this? We're just kids, you know? We want to be force-fed things. So we're very malleable with our taste. And, you know, because the names I just mentioned were the most popular and the most played on radio and TV, people like Busta, I didn't appreciate until now. And you go back and you realize how dope and how ahead of his time he actually is. I swear on my life, I had this convo with the youngster, maybe... Two, three months ago, we were just talking about music and Black Thought and Busted Rhymes. And there's a name I'm forgetting that I'm probably going to get to very, very soon. <laughs> mm, disappointed myself there. <laughs> but those two guys, nah, bro. They are so high up on my list now, man. Black Thought and Yeah, and they Busta. can rapidly fucking rap. For sure. Without <laughs> being too boring. That's the thing, man. I feel like. Not at all, dude. Yeah. Busta is hilarious, dude. Like, like Busta is genuinely <laughs> one of the funniest rappers out there. For sure. Like, oh. I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan. I forgot to mention Luda. Can't not mention Luda, man. Oh, Luda of course, was also, yes. Yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say Luda was one of the inspirations back then as well. He was, he was See, now he's shit. someone I got into a bit later. Yeah. He was wanting shit, though. Like, I've, I've never put him in that category of, like, overtly funny or overtly lyrical, but he has a blend of charisma and flow and lyrical ability mm. and an ability to make a hit song as well as strong albums that can't be ignored. I mean, that's basically everything you'd want to be as an artist. Conscious, he's got songs like Runaway Love that, like, transcended what it was supposed to do, you know? It was supposed to be meaningful records on his album, and it turned out being singles, that did well on the radio and like you're hearing about girls running away from home after being abused and you're just like what they playing this on the radio and after you question it you start to understand it and unknowingly he's giving you an understand that's the beauty of hip-hop when it's done you know that way apart from everything yeah. else that's so enjoyable about it that's a, that was a moment for me you know it was just like yo this is a reality people are dealing with that i've been blinded to and I didn't watch a documentary or the news to open my eyes. Like I heard a song and it was just like, yo, you know? So. Yeah, dude, like Lupe Fiasco, like is one of the hey. people who put me on my fucking feminist journey, you know? Like sure. with Bitch Bad. Like that, that definitely made me think more. Like I, I hadn't considered, genuinely, I hadn't considered the politics or power of the word bitch mm -hmm. until I fucking listened to Lupe Fiasco because I dug a, what was a kick push mm -hmm. and then i get into his other stuff and i'm like oh snap yeah okay i'm learning some things here for sure lupe is right up there on my list man I, like lupe is honestly top five for me just for for those first two albums alone man not not many people have an album like the cool or an album like food and liquor let alone both under their belt and it's just like yeah he 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 literally took conscious rap to a it needed to be, and I feel like if he didn't exist, neither would Kendrick. Kendrick would not That's exist. That's pretty fair. Yeah, like Ken Kendrick would not exist without a Lupe fiasco. Lupe made it cool to be you. Lupe wasn't... And also doing concepts and stuff like that for as sure. well. For sure. I mean, there's, there's a lot, lot of other conceptual rappers and a lot of other rappers that were dope at making good written music, but Lupe's music sounded good. I think that's what's important is that Food and liquor and the cool sound nice and they are strong mm -hmm. lyrically, you know, 
and they could be on the radio and they could be on TV. Like, and that's where exactly. you can put it onto the party for sure. You know, and it wouldn't be like the end of the party. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> no disrespect to Immortal Technique or Jedi Mind Tricks or all those dope ass rappers trying to push their, you know, lyrical message and really awaken the people to the evils of the world and just how it is. But we ain't trying to hear that shit when we chilling, bro. <laughs> Did you uh, get into Black Star at all? Oh, for sure, man. Those two dudes, they are, they faulty, man. Like, shout out. Yeah, they were out. a big influence early on for me as well. Yeah. I want to say shout out to Talib, but he turned out to be an idiot. So so is Lupe, but <laughs> Lupe is a forgivable idiot. You know what I mean? Like, I just feel like he's, he's too comfortable in himself and half the time he's trolling. But Talib seems yeah, like what is, what is up with, yeah, the conscious rappers and that? Because, like, even Karius <laughs> One's kind of, like, just gone off the deep end, man. It's hey, kind man. of weird. Don't you feel like it's just, this is what I feel, and this is why I, I hate being called that. And, like, I despise it. I feel like it's their false sense of superiority. You know, they really feel like they're smarter mm. than they, their listeners. And when their listeners are actually educated and they, they don't realize that we have the internet too, bro. Like we got the same access to information you do now. They forget that and they try and treat people and act like, you know, we are lesser. And, and that's the dangers of trying to be a conscious rapper and trying to be that person that's spreading the word or spreading the light. You know, you get caught up in that when your success doesn't match what you complex. Yep, Dude, that's what it is. That's exactly what it is. Like, you, I can't see any other reason for it because clearly in their music and some of the songs that they have, they have a complete understanding of many of things and how the world works, you know, from the reason why feminism exists to, you know, racial inequalities, to systematic racism, to slavery, to even money, you know, the whole concept of money. These dudes rap about all these things and they're well-versed in that. And then later on in their careers, when things don't go according to plan, they feel like they were the carriers of those thoughts, the purveyors of that. They were the ones that, oh, we put you onto this, you know, so we are this, like, get the fuck out of here, bro. We have the internet now. Like, we don't have to listen to your boarding apps anymore. We can Google it. <laughs> so that's what I think the uh, problem is with some of those quote unquote conscious rappers. Hate that term. When did you start rapping? Hey man, for fun, around like I'd say grade seven already. Like I remember like my first actual memory that I, I have, like there's probably another one, but I remember being on stage for the longest time, you know. I always wanted to perform whether it was gonna be I, I wanted to be a singer. This is on record. If I could sing, I would not be rapping, bro. I'm, I'm going to say that straight. Bro, if I could sing, I would not be doing comedy. <laughs> Dude, I am <laughs> I am so, so sincere. Like, you know, I can hold a note, you know. I'm not going to uh, overextend myself. <laughs> now, see, I can. I can hold a young note, you know. I got maybe like a two, young two octave range. But apart from, <laughs> apart from that, I, I would not be... I would not be rapping, but my earliest memory I have was, and I actually came across it early in the year again in, in a dream. Like, I just remembered this thing. So, is it a dream or is it an actual memory? But I remember in grade seven, I was sitting by a bench and someone was playing corny chords on a guitar that they just learned because they did music in primary school, after school, you know, parents pay for those kind of lessons and shit. And I was just rapping, having fun. But seriously, I'd say 16, 15, 16. But okay. always love. What do you mean by seriously? Writing consistently, like I'm talking books and books <laughs> of writing. I just, I literally just had a performance on on Sunday, and someone came up to me on some like, "Yo, bro, like I remember you from UDubs, bro. Like you were you were sitting like outside your car, or some shit, with a book, and you were like writing." And I asked you what you were doing, and you're like, "Nah, I'm writing raps." I still wanted to be like, you know, was I doing homework? Maybe it was actually being like a staunch like student. It's like, nah, you were writing raps. So that's, you know, 18, 19. Yeah, it's the homework. That's the homework that matters. You know what I mean? Like, that's that, that's my love, man. And that, that happened from about 15, 16. So it was a consistent thing where I actually started to enjoy it and really tested myself and repeatedly wrote. And I have a lot of those books still. Like, I'm grateful that I was able to keep a lot of those things. So... Away. Yeah, I've got a pile of my joke books literally sitting right next to me. And I've got even my very first one. And every now and again, I go back to it and I cringe. And every now and again, I go back to it and I'm like, damn, that's actually a good joke. Yes, Maybe sir. I should refresh it. <laughs> that's how it always goes. 
Yeah, it's it's quite fun. Did you ever get into battle rapping? For sure, man. There was a phase where I loved battle rapping, you know, all its toxicity included. You know, you can mm. say what you want about it, but, you know, people out there love Quentin Tarantino and he's always inwording it up in his movies and someone has to write that script and chances are they're not black. So are you mad at battle rap for <laughs> the amount of faulty things that they say in the name of combat? And if you are, it's not for you. You know, don't listen to it. But yeah. if you can get past that, there's there's an art there that is undeniably one of the, I feel, one of the strongest sections of rap music. It's just like you have to out-rap someone, you know, whether you get into their heads by insulting them or whether you just outwit them with your wordplay. It's still so admirable. And I've done like two battles. Like I was lucky enough to, to be on Scrambles for Money twice. My oh first, yes, I remember that actually. Yeah, my first battle I, I was actually on that. the main card and people hated me for that, bro. They were the rappers that have been trying to get onto that main card forever. It was just, <laughs> ah, the game is the game, gents. Because I, hey, I was feeling myself like maybe three, four years ago, like I really feeling myself. I felt like I was at like lyrically, not musically or the whole craft, but like wordplay wise and what I was doing with the pen I felt like I was at the peak of my powers in terms of like what I could do and I just decided I fuck it anyone in Cape Town there's 2,000 then Let, let's organize something at a club anyway I got 2k on me you know I wasn't boiling like that but I really was about mm -hmm. to pay someone 2k if they could out rap me and then battle rappers obviously got wind of this tweet and they were like hey bruh Come, come do that talk where it matters, bro. Don't try and get innocent bystanders and try and look cool. Come battle actual battle rappers. So I was like, all right, fuck it then. And Jake Baker was one of the first ones to, to actually respond to that. And I freestyled like videos. They probably still on Twitter. Like if you can find them. Dude, I, I can't <laughs> believe I asked you if you've battle rapped and I actually remember all of this now. <laughs> you mentioned scrambling for money. I can yeah. remember this whole saga. I was were upset, bro. Yep. And you were just dropping videos and like yep. eventually people were like, oh, same, okay. Same day. Like they tested me. They were like, ah, who, who are you, bro? Like you out here doing your little rap thing on beat. Like you can't come sit with us. I was like, bro, I really rap. You guys must not know how obsessed I am with my craft. And... Yeah, man, that shit was cool. And some of the most genuine motherfuckers, like once that camera's off, I promise you, it was just one of the like dope so communities love. to be around. Like no, no lie. <laughs> it really was so eye opening to know that people like that. Yeah, I've even seen exist. that firsthand because I've watched Scrambles for Money like here in Durban, like mm -hmm. when they've done it. And it's, it's quite fun to see the guys get on stage and just hate each other and then hug like straight afterwards essentially for sure and it, it's deeper than that man on some real life shit like those dudes are some real ones man it goes beyond just hugging each other and having a drink or having no. a smoke like they look out for one another man and that's it's a rare thing and that kind of unity is non-existent in, in terms of hip-hop Okay, so, so subtle technical difficulties there, but yeah, we were getting into the intricacies of battle rap and how that scene actually is very, that's the, they have the unity that, you know, you wish the rest of hip hop would have basically. As individuals, as groups, it's still a competitive sport, you know, and there's yeah. still politics involved and there's still, you know, the usual egotistic bullshit that comes with this craft. It's a contact craft, you know, it's been like that from the jump, you know, I feel like once once it had evolved from and yeah okay it's a whole nother portal i'm about to open <laughs> but a, a lot of these dudes and love to the battle rap and i'm i'm you know I'm, I'm not ignoring or not concluding i'm just saying as beautiful as the unity is there's still politics and there's still egotistical bullshit so that's the end of that but it's all love to everyone there hip-hop itself hey man when when you go back and like my understanding and I think the broader public's understanding of most hip hop documentaries is that it started as party music in New York, right? Like that's <laughs> like that they were spinning break beats and stuff, having parties like cool Herc and them dudes. Like, is that not the original, yeah. you know, yeah, kind two of turntables and a Mac. That was it. Hey bruh. And then people get mad at people making party music, you know, albeit the message is derogative and it's deeper now because there's a whole system behind it and people are, you know. Bro, what was the message behind Rapper's Delight? <laughs> Talk to me, bro. You know, like these dudes get to a point of, like I said, this Messiah complex, like we, we discussed earlier, it's just like, guys, 
that's video, man. Watch any documentary and see where it started because they're always like, oh, go back to what real hip hop is. Like, bro, hip hop was party music, man. It was unifying. It was beautiful. It was happy. And if the music talking about, you know, liquor and women and drugs is making people happy, sorry for you, man. I highly apologize, but it was like that in the 60s and it wasn't hip hop. It was like that in the 50s and it wasn't hip hop. It was always like that, bro. So get off your little high horse, man. Let hip hop be what it's being. Let it go. It's different facets and it's different lanes. That's the beauty of it is there's a lot of genres and things that stem from jazz music and all that music that would not exist had they not experimented and done what they were doing. Imagine classical jazz trained trumpet, like listening to some shit from the 50s or 60s. You know what I mean? Imagine like a, a guitarist listening to Zeppelin in the 60s. Like, what is this? You know, this is not technically good music. Get the fuck out of here, man. Like, that's my main thing about how juvenile I think the scene still is here is that everyone is such a critic without actually fully understanding everything about the music and really appreciating it for what it is rather than for what they want out of it. Like, just don't play it then. Just don't be that critical then. That's kind of become my philosophy with everything, even though, like, my job is to be a critic. A lot of the time it is just like... If it's not for me, I'm not going to fucking listen to it. Like, if I'm being mm -hmm. paid to engage with it and tell you my opinion, cool, I'll do that. But mm -hmm. in, in general, if I don't fucking like something and I don't think it's hugely detrimental <laughs> to anything, then yeah, fuck, what's, what is it to me? Like, why, why would it bug me what other people are listening to? I'm not listening to it, so where's the fucking problem? And we're in an age where you can literally listen to whatever you want at any second and people exactly. still choose to be mad. You know, <laughs> me, I'm just mad at the fact that the Cape Town scene for me has not progressed as much as I wanted to. Maybe it's a personal thing for me, you know, and it's not even about me and my career, you know, like I've, I've had a fairly good year for someone that didn't plan on making a project. I got to put out the really dope project that was me, you know, I didn't do it for a specific reason there's there's no specific club record or specific radio record it's just music i made during lockdown that was for me by me and if you enjoy it i love you for that so my grip with the scene is just there are so many other talented people i listen to that i like that could progress but their friends keep hyping up mediocre bullshit man and it's just been stuck like that for like six years i'm from that era where i I had to go battle rap, you know, you were a rapper. I feel like it's one of those things I had to take off my list. Like, can you stand in front of strangers in a whole different city in the middle of the night where you know nobody? And can you be comfy off of just your raps? You know, is, is your talent, does it stand for that? Can you do that? And the same thing with radio, you know, same thing with all the other facets of things that I've tried to do in terms of just out and out, out to rap people, out and out, out concept them with some of the projects. It's always been competitive and I, I'm from a time where I, I got on stage at school and if I fucked up at school rapping, I'd have to go sit in class with those people. It's a different kind of embarrassment. These days you can just put your phone off, bro. If you fucked up or you did some fuck shit, you can log out of Twitter. You can log out of Instagram, you know, okay, ignore Tyler. that and carry on. <laughs> yeah, the age old Tyler tweet, you know, there's no such thing as cyberbullying, bro. Just switch your phone off. <laughs> so I I'm from that time where there was no way for me to hide. So criti criticism came with it, you know, it was part of it and it's always been a part of art. And it's always about progression, but, you know, I feel like that that part of it's missing. Nowadays, you crit someone, then you're a hater. Like, how am I a hater, bro? Like, are you not trying to get better at what you're doing? Yeah, and it's also, I mean, it is a part of the process. Like, like when you are an artist and you put art out into the world, the public is going to engage with it. That is mm -hmm. literally fucking how the process works. And unfortunately, you can't pick how people are going to engage with what you've done. Sometimes they're going to fucking hate it and other people are going to love it. I was actually last week chatting to Pumlani Pakoli about criticism and basically how whenever we would hate on something with Durban is yours, all the fans of whatever it is we were hating on would come and say how much they fucking loved it. So mm. I don't know. To me, it's just it is part of the process and you've got to have a thick skin or yeah, log out like but at the same time, some people are just fucking dickheads with their criticism. Mm -hmm. And that was also something Pomelani was talking about last week. It's, you know, it's got to be considered. You've got to actually really think about why you feel that way about something before putting that opinion out there. And too many people, 
just go that's whack and then that's it and that that is definitely an issue but for me and and my frustration again with the scene is that i don't think anything's been overtly whack like if you whack you whack like you know that in your heart and in your soul like you know that Bro, i don't sorry. know i don't know if whack people know that to be honest because like in comedy and <laughs> rap and so many things dude i have been sent so much stuff uh, and the illusions of grandeur that some people have like just don't match up with their talents unfortunately and amen it's fucking tragic dude because people are so they believe that they're gonna make it and it's like there's just literally no fucking chance dude you can't even rap on the beat like it's are you listening to your music are you listening to other people's music do you see what's different here and a lot of the time people don't see it they're a little bit delusional and i don't know what happens to those people i actually and genuinely worry about them and that is my issue is that everyone has to start somewhere, bro. So if you rap in off beat and everyone's perceiving your shit as trash, listen to that. H how am I to tell you that in two years time, you can't be the greatest thing this country has ever seen, but you're never going to know that unless you actually accept critical listening, you know, exactly. if people have engaged in your art, however trash it may be to them, they've still spent time of their lives listening to that. And if they take extra time to even try and tell you where to improve, that's the biggest compliment that you can get, bro. That's just how I felt about it all along. It's just like, if you number one, spend three, four minutes listening to a song of mine, and then you still have extra time to still type out the way you're feeling about it, on your deathbed, you're not getting those eight minutes back, bro. So <laughs> that's the best compliment you can give me is them eight minutes of your life. I'm I'm taking that on a chin and i'm really gonna listen to that you know and really be like i i appreciate that if i think it's bullshit fuck you if i don't i'm gonna take it and i'm gonna try and improve you know so next time that's at least one listener you've ticked off the list because they engaged in your art what more do you want because if they don't engage you're just doing this as a hobby keep it as a folder on your laptop then but if you're putting it out for the public to listen to and you're not open to criticism or be it from you know i don't have the answers i don't have a grammy Fuck the Grammys, by the way. Keep that on record. Hey, like, keep that on record. I don't even want you to edit that out. Um, but I don't have these awards and these things for to to be sitting on a high horse trying to tell people what to do. You know, I know that, but I love this shit. So if you're rapping and you're making hip hop, I'm a consumer too. You know, don't take that away from me. Because now, just because I rap and make music, I'm not supposed to have an opinion on your art or what you do. And if I do, I'm a hater. Nah, bro. I listen to this. Shit. I love this shit. You know, it's from it's so, from love of hip hop that you go exactly. Like yeah, and I yeah. just I just wish that you know it, people would take the little bit of the dope things that they have and and listen to us as listeners. And I feel like it's it's what I've been doing my whole life. And even though the process has been slow for me in in a lot of fans' eyes. I still feel like I haven't ever let them down. And that's the best thing for me is that I sleep at night knowing that there's at least five songs on like a project of mine that someone who really enjoys my music is going to like. And I don't even make it like that. You know, I don't go, oh, let me make this song because the people who listen to my music are going to love it. It's just I'm um, undeniably me and they don't get that anywhere else. So if on those other five songs, I'm maybe doing a little flow that is a bit new school or maybe, you know, paying homage to this person, I know for a fact they'll still find something they can't find anywhere else, you know? And, and that's one of my things is just like dudes be biting whole melodies, whole flows from these people that are popping, you know, internationally. And they expect you to just sit there and eat that bullshit up. The whole sonics of their shit sounds copy pasted what's popping. And I get that it's an industry. I get you got to play mean, the game. you're literally describing the South African hip hop radio for the last Let's fucking years. go, dog. Let's go. Because that's what it is. It's copy paste, bro. How can you expect me to just listen to your copy paste music? And sometimes it sounds good. But how do you expect me to just not say anything? And you know in your heart where you copied that from. We can all hear. Like everyone can hear the beats the same, the flows are the same. And then, ah, man. I still remember another rapper. He said it off the record, so I won't mention his name, but he once All told good. me that Casper uh, and your vest and AKA were two sides of the same Drake coin. I don't even think it's that, man. I think they, there was a time it was. Yeah, like, not for anymore, sure. But, but both yeah, of those was did like fully just go into what's international casper especially like just listens to what's happening overseas and then tries to remake it for himself but there was that period where drake was the most like drake was the best south african rapper basically 
<laughs> you're not lying, dog. You're not lying. I, Drake was the best Jamaican rapper as well at the stage. <laughs> the best, he was the best UK rapper two years ago. What you mean, dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh man I, th that's so true you know and again you you can't not be influenced by things but there's a very fine line between influence and copy pasting man and i just feel like it, it's it's not it's not beneficial to you to stay stuck in that zone and for your peoples to hype you up when you are literally copy pasting shit it's not going to get you anywhere and if it does how do you bro but you get no respect from me. You know, you lose all credibility and my credibility doesn't pay your bills. So if you're trying to play the game, by all means, be my guest. Just, I just can't fuck with you forever. Like forever. I'm sorry. That's just my thing. Yeah, I feel quite similarly in quite a few different art forms. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, you were mentioning, you know, people criticizing and it helps you improve and stuff. Who are some of the people when you were a younger rapper that would, you know, tell you, yo, this isn't so good or, you know, you could improve here and there. Who are some of the people that took you under their wing? First and foremost, I have to shout out Ibrahim Inglis, EBI. He's a radio DJ in Cape Town. And EB met me when I was in grade E. 11 i think it was and i had this random verse in some guy's project and he heard the verse and he really liked what i was doing he was one of the first dudes in the quote unquote industry you know albeit radio which is actually right up my alley but he's not on the side of radio that you know would consider him a peer you know he wasn't rapping like that and he's a very very nice singer too but he was one of the first you know he gave me some genuine help and genuine criticism to to improve my craft djc live from 5M years ago, he was doing a show called Hip Hop Power Nights. Um, he, yeah, he was kind enough to actually like fly me up for an interview. I think the interview's still there. And then sadly enough, I didn't get interviewed by him. I got interviewed by another lady that took his place that evening because he was busy and something came up. But Sea Life definitely always used to give me some really dope just feedback. And sometimes it wasn't, you know, always positive in terms of, you know, just helping me become a better version of myself. And yeah, man, when Jao Matthews was popping on Twitter, he was also one of those people that really just took a liking to me and my craft. And he, he was also not overtly just nice all the time, you know. And apart from all of that, I have to give myself that as well, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, am, I am my own best and worst critic, you know. And I, I really am super critical of myself. You know, I hold myself to a standard and... I try and keep it there at all times. I try and disassociate, especially, you know, after lockdown, I kind of, I've always been producing. So, you know, lockdown kind of forced my hand to just make beats because my mother is, you know, in that high risk category and she's diabetic as well. So that's just one of those things where I really had to just get locked in and kind of improve my craft for what it was. And since then, I've been able to, kind of skip my mind between production and rapper and the rapper would criticize the producer and the producer would criticize the rapper. So, you know, it's been like that for the longest time, but yeah, man, a, a lot of the industry folk won't tell you straight up on some real shit, like, you know, do this, do that. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of the weirdest. You've got to learn, for me. learn yourself and use YouTube or just fuck it up and learn from that. For sure. Fucking up is the best teacher and also body language, man. Body language is everything. When when you're with these people, I look people dead in the eyes, man. Eyes, I, the eyes won't lie. Like, for sure. People can tell you how nice your music is and their eyes are just like, mm, that shit's trash, bro. Always look at the eyes. <laughs> oh, fuck. You you just sold me out, dude. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> so many I'm people sorry, are bro. now going to look me in the eyes when they're asking about my opinion on their shit. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, bro, but it's the damn truth. <laughs> you really want to know how someone feels no, about your shit. No, look dude, I know. Because, like, yeah, like, when I have to, like, try and be nice about something... I yeah. shift everywhere, bro. You can't look. You can't look someone straight in the eye and lie to them, <laughs> dude. You either gonna like scratch your chin and look at the shoulder or some shit. You gonna do, bro? I've seen it so or, many or times. Pull out, pull out your phone, you know. Oh, I got a message. <laughs> yeah, no. So that song you were doing. Let me just check this message. Yeah, no, it wasn't too bad, bro. Um, yeah, I got this message. Thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, like the who, second verse. <laughs> yeah, who, who did the hook, bro? Who did the hook? <laughs> the beat's not too bad, bro. Did you produce that? Did you have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. So it's just all about taking it 
it on the chin, man. And just remember at the end of the day, no one can do you as well as you can. So just do you. That's like the worst and best advice I feel that's ever stuck with me ever since. You know, if I look at all the rappers that are popping, you know, bar Drake becoming the kind of cu culture fluid <laughs> rapper that he is, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. When, when, Drake, when, when Drake was starting out, Drake was Drake, you know, yeah. everyone wanted a piece of Drake, you know, on their first album with Thank Me Later, he was doing something no one else had. Same with Kanye, same with Lupe, same with Jay, same with anyone you can think of. Just do you, man. Kendrick, Cole, um, some of the new school dudes, even Cuddy, you know, Cuddy, I've never heard a Kid Cuddy verse where I was like, oh my word, this is so dope, you know, look but at you, them bars. But you always know Kid Cuddy. But like, you know, it's a... You know what I mean? He has something no one else has. And, you know, if you don't like his vulnerability or how soft he is or how open he is about his insecurities and whatever, and you think that shit's soft, that's on you. But he's probably more successful than that rapper criticizing him, you know, because he offered something nobody else did. So do you, man. Like, we, we can expand on that for literally another hour. Well, but on, on that note, though, what do you offer that nobody else does? I, I feel like I offer a sound that is current, you know, I, I feel like I have been so influenced by what's happened before. I'm so influenced by what's happening right now. And also just, I'm trying to like avoid the corny words, like authenticity and all that <laughs> bullshit. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to just phrase bro. it, <laughs> you know, like this is real hip hop. Nah, none of that bullshit. Um, I'm me you know, and, and you're not going to find this anywhere else. So if you can find Afonso song and I'm talking from the ground up in terms of the hook, in terms of the lyrics, in terms of the flows, in terms of the beat, like I have been influenced by many a song and there's been many beats that have influenced me. But if you can find one record that sounds exactly like, exactly like something else, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you whatever's in my account. You know, and if it's going to be 1,753 Rand, then that's all you're getting, bro. But, you know, if, if it's looking healthy, you can get that. And I stand by that. That's my word forever is that you're not going to get no copy-paste bullshit from me, man. And right. and that's all I that's all I can stay true to is is me. I can't tell you that it's going to be some, like, futuristic, otherworldly bullshit because you're influenced by everything around you. You know, that's right now you I could can, be influenced. Yeah, like I was saying earlier, like, I can tell some of your influences on like your album but at the same time it's completely you and it's it makes sense it's like there were some things where i was like ah i you know i think uh, like the there was a particular song fuck i can't remember it now but like i was like damn that's um and now i'm even blanking so <laughs> fuck but it was a kind of that fuck what's that track with schoolboy q and uh, that was on uh the dude who's who does heavenly father Ah oh, fuck. Uh, sorry, dude. Um, but yeah, basically, like, I could tell there was, like, a bit of a TDE vibe, but also, as I was saying, like, so much, like, cool G-Unit stuff, so much, like, cool just mid-2000s in, in the production side. But then when it comes through to your raps, literally no one yeah. sounds like you. Shout out, man. And you are spot on except for the TDE stuff, you know? I was hoping really? you were going to say a song or something. Yeah, I didn't listen to any of that, man. Th this was, like, I... Literally, oh, Isaiah Rashad. That's what I was thinking. Isaiah Rashad, Absol, oh, and fucking dude, um, Isaiah. I, I was bumping for sure. I was bumping okay. Isaiah, not that not Schoolboy, but well, he there was the one track that Schoolboy features on on Isaiah's record. That's that's yeah. the one. There was a particular track that's one of your songs reminded me of, and I was like, ooh, yeah. I hear you, but, I, and I know what song you're talking about. I wish I knew the name now, but it's a long <laughs> song. It's like a six, seven minute song, but it's fucking dope. And it's got yeah, this dude. cool little, like almost horn sample, like fluty blow. I know yeah. what song you're talking about. It sounds about, like man. a drive bar, basically. Like just slow, literally. Slow. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as I, I got into Sylvia demo, just actually like beginning of this year. Oh, wow. Yeah, dude, I was sleeping. I'm, I'm not. That album is fucking incredible. God damn. That's amazing, bro. And what actually got me to that was uh, Westside Boogie's album. I don't Ooh. know if you've listened to Everything's For Sale, but that that album, yeah, man. And someone in the comments of like someone's review on that album said that it reminded them a lot of Sylvia Demo and the fact that he's still a hood dude, but, you know, the vulnerability wasn't like Cuddy's. Cuddy's is very palatable for, especially not to bring race into this, but Cuddy's very palatable to, for white kids, you know, white kids can love Cuddy. dude. 
You, you know what I mean? That's just how Cuddy is. That's how he's built. And he's never been shy of that from his first mixtapes. He's never ignored, like, you know, the fact of Caucasian music is beautiful when it's done right, you know, as much as a lot of it's <laughs> stolen from black music in the early, you know, 20s and 30s and 40s. But there's still been exceptional music made. There's no denying that. And Cuddy's never been afraid of that. But what Isaiah Rashad did and what I feel Westside Boogie did is that they made albums that were hip hop, but extremely vulnerable talking about depression talking about you know trigger warning suicidal thoughts and all yeah. those things in a way that wasn't palatable for anyone unless they loved hip-hop and that's got nothing to do with race it was just hip-hop so yeah man beautiful projects but the inspirations for this project i think if you don't hear Timberland and Pharrell all over that and Chad that, Hugo, that's I what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Mid two thousands, like it's for it sure, like one hundred percent. That's what I was bumping. That's what I was assessing. I was assessing why can in the middle of a set, like you could play the biggest, like you could play Roddy Rich's "The Box" right now, biggest song of the year for me. I feel like you you couldn't go anywhere without hearing "Heaven at the Coop with the Light." like you couldn't go anywhere and you know you could play that song and then play anything from the 2000s and it will stand its ground it will stand its ground in any environment whether it be radio whether it be club so what is it about what they were doing back then you know was it like the analog hardware was it the million dollar budgets they had to make albums back <laughs> then like what was it that made that music so good from the R&B to the hip hop to even the rock music like it was all it was special around that time, you know, rock, I don't have the grounds to stand for, but there are some beautiful indie albums that were made around that time that for yeah. me, I still bump. Um, but you know, I feel like that they had every era, you know, with the rock, it's like 60s, 70s, 80s. There's always something that pops in those eras. But for hip hop, having started in the 80s and it's fairly still true young. for now, yeah. it's still young. So, you know, what is it about that time that made it so special? And that's what I was trying to, you know, capture. And again, there's, there's a difference between copying and being influenced by, and I am unashamedly telling people I was influenced by what I was listening to. I did not make this project to say, hey, look, this is groundbreaking. Like, this is a new sound from Fonzo. No, it's called Days of the Future Past, bro. Like, it's something like the whole name people think is from the movie, but the movie was the last thing on my mind when I came up with the name and when I thought about the name. Cause I just felt like it was a, a stepping stone into the future of Fonzo, but I was also kind of paying homage to the past and the sounds. Cause all I had was music, you know, I kind of ran out of dope CDs and movies to watch. Lord knows I've watched too many black and white movies that I don't feel are very groundbreaking. Shout out to you guys from that time though. Alfred Hitchcock and Amanda, I see you guys. I should go to I mean, so is Vertigo. Like, they are decent yeah. movies. Oh, Vertigo like, is fucking man. incredible. What do you mean? Like, one of the best you know shot I mean? movies but, ever. But yeah, but some, it, other, it's just, some other stuff falls short. No, I mean, a, a lot. Let's not be too kind. Like, when people <laughs> are excellent, they are excellent and they deserve to get their dap. But there's a lot of the other movies on some of those lists where I'm just like, oh, this is so underwhelming to me, you know, to, to any other purist of the visual art form. I am sorry. Um, but the same goes for music. So I was looking for the excellence and the Neptunes were excellence personified in their time, the way they blended Latin sounding music and just the percussion into just some soulful and rock shit all at the same time. That shit was otherworldly, man. And, and Timberland with his synths and what he did with Genuine's album and with Mercy stuff and with Aaliyah stuff at the beginning was also like, what is he doing? Like, who came up with this? Like, what was his inspiration? And, and then I, I dived further back into some of the other things. And I, I'd like to talk to Fidel one day and actually ask him, you know, how much industrial rock inspired his sound? Because his use of percussion is very Nine Inch Nails-esque. Well, yeah. And I say this... Whoa. I mean, you yeah. know, you know, nerd like NERD, like they were a fucking rock group. Like they, for sure, they, they made some pretty damn good rap metal. <laughs> like genuinely, <laughs> no, hundred percent, man. And people don't know this, you know. So my use of percussion on a lot of those songs stems from all of those influences, you know. And hence, it's called Days of the Future Past, man. It's just like a nod to the past and a glimpse to the future, and it really just means now. So that that's what I have to offer, and I always will. Is is me gain. You're not gonna hear no fucking i'm so unique i'm so authentic nah i'm just me man and if you fuck with me on on that level you you'll do so for the rest of the time because 
I can't see myself conforming. You know, I can see myself trying to make radio hits and trying to, you know, play the game for what it is. Because at the end of the day, there's bills that need to be paid, but there is no ways you will not hear something that is undeniably me in some way, shape or form. So that's me. Sweet. I think we can, uh, we can actually leave it there. So bro, thanks for your time. And I know you, you had something you needed to tell people. Hey, so I need you guys um, just to be aware on, on Monday. Um, I'm yeah. at Official Fonzo on all the socials and I got some really, really fucking like exciting news to tell you guys on Monday. And yeah, can't, can't wait for you guys to see that. And thank you to everyone who's made it this far. You are the real MVPs. And yeah, to everyone we lost along the way, it's still love. And Bob, thank you for a lovely conversation, man. And we should definitely do this like once a year. I feel like I'm going to say that to you. We should check up and, and have this convo once a year, man. It would be dope because uh, from here on out. Yeah, I definitely plan to get pretty much everyone back because my audience is still small. But one day it won't be. And, you know, for sure. we need to get everyone back and just let people know how people have progressed. But yeah, so on the 30th of November, depending on when you're listening to this, go check out Fonzo's Twitter account. The news is fucking big, like, and it's well-deserved and I'm stoked for you, bro, because I have watched your career for a long time. I wouldn't say from the beginning, but yeah. probably like a quarter of the way through. I don't know. And I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, your music. I've really enjoyed what you put out there. And I've been waiting for other people to notice. And so I'm hoping that this gets you a little bit further, maybe along the fucking process. And yeah, people can get you on fucking radio because there are some tracks that you've got on this album that can definitely play. So yeah, man, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm in your corner. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you pull off from here. Appreciate it, man. And, and all love to you and your career and the many endeavors that, you know, I've, I've seen you, you take on. And the most beautiful thing for me about all of these things is that it, it's never done in any sort of way other than in love, man. From the events you mm -hmm. used to do, from the writing, from the comedy, to this oh, podcast, bro, everything tried that to you've touched. I fucking you on a festival once, man. I was <laughs> so bummed that that never actually happened. Hey, um, man. The, the man pulling the purse strings eventually said no but fuck we were close to getting to fly you up for outland shout out no nah, man it ain't no thing these things happen man is you can never ever ever you know hold anything or anything against anyone especially not in this industry if you don't have that understanding that anything can change at any second this is not the industry for you chaps <laughs> man. that's the cold hard truth so it's all love bro you're one of those genuine genuine dudes and it, it just it shines through in all that you do man so just know we appreciate you i appreciate you and thank you for the love and everyone thank you for listening and hope to have you guys on the rest of my journey man much love thank you for having me